So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, November the 26th, and for a lot of us here in the United States, it is uh, Thanksgiving weekend, so a lot of people are off just sitting around eating a lot of food and doing nothing in particular, hopefully. But if you notice during the opening today, you have a lot of snow. I mean, the things have changed rapidly. And it is 28 degrees Fahrenheit outside, minus 2 Celsius. And this is episode number 135 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. And I'm glad that you're taking the time to watch today. We've got some questions. People put stuff in. By the way, before we do anything else, look down in the video description to see what we're going to talk about today and find some links that might get you into further reading and more information about some of the things I'm going to talk about today. But tomorrow's Saturday. Write this down if you're interested in chiming in for the live chat because people want me to tell them, Fred, when are you going to do these live streams? We never know. It's just a pop-up and then I miss it. So tomorrow, Saturday, 4 p.m., November the 27th, Eastern Standard Time, United States. So if you want to join me tomorrow, going to be live. We're just going to field questions from you, from anybody that shows up. She's going to sit around and talk about things because, let's be honest, it's winter time now. What on earth could you be doing outside? Although, also before we get started, because if you're sitting here right now and you've got a bunch of snow in your bee yard, a couple of beehives over there, what should you be doing? Go out there and clean out those entrances so that at least your entrance reducer is open and make sure that there's airflow through there, that there aren't dead bees piled up. Because now the game is on. This is the challenge for all beekeepers in cold climates. We want to find out if we can get our bees through winter. So we've done all the work. The bees have done all the work and we've done our part. And let's hope that they get through. Jumping right into the very first question, which was posted just today. Michael Hall. Hey Fred, should I stop thinking I could get a queen from the new hive I had in July and think of buying one instead? I was saying these bees are so fantastic. Could I get a queen out of these bees and uh, the genetics? I am not forgetting it's my first few months of beekeeping. Is it correct to wait until I see queen cells before doing anything at all? So, of course, this is a great time of year to be thinking about that. What is your stock going to be in the spring? And although some of you in the Southern Hemisphere are in spring and summer already, so you're in a different situation, you're already dealing with a rapid uh, increase in your colonies. So you've already done what you're going to do, probably. And uh, you're enjoying warm weather. Good for you. Anyway, when we're thinking about spring here, a couple of things. One, make sure that you've got beekeeping equipment. This is Black Friday, they call it here, and that's because a lot of things are on sale. Go to your favorite beekeeping supplier, and this is the time to order your stuff in. So if you're going to have nucleus boxes, if you need some hive equipment, if you need some frames, anything at all, most of them are giving good discounts right now. So stop watching, come back later, hit pause, and get your bee supplies now so that you're ready in spring when your hives split and swarm and do everything else. So Moving on to Michael's question here. If you get a colony that comes through winter, that is great stock to work with because they survived. You have a good queen. So it says here, uh, should I stop thinking I could get a queen from the new hive? Well, if that colony makes it through, I highly recommend being ready with another bee box, 8 frame or 10 frame Langstroth. I'm assuming just because it's the most popular. So you'll also need to have your frames and equipment ready to go because the frames that you pull out of your existing colony, if it's nice and strong, and what do we want to see in there? A good population buildup, good brood pattern, and a good brood pattern means that the capped brood is in a nice tight cluster. And that helps them going through winter too because if the brood pattern was spread all over the place, it takes a lot more resources for your clustered bees to keep that brood warm as you get into early next year when they start really increasing their brood because before things warm up and before the weather really turns for the best or for the better, let's say, let's be conservative. A lot has been going on in the hive before we ever see the activity outside. So the increase can happen rapidly. So would you just buy in a queen? If you're just buying in a queen, you're going to have to split your colony anyway. So what I like to do, if we have a colony that we really like in our own backyard apiary, and hopefully you're also allowing drones 
to be produced in your colonies too. Because if you've got positive genetics, really good genetics, you want those drones out there spreading those genetics around. But likewise, guess what else is happening in spring? Someone else whose colony made it through winter, their queen made it through winter, they're sending out their drones. So any way you slice it, you've probably got really good adapted regional stock for your own bees. So then what you can do when they're producing in spring next year, and it's a nice warm day hopefully because we don't want to chill the brood, so you want temps in the high 70s, low 80s preferably, and you want to do the split when most of your bees are foraging, you want them to be out, so anywhere from noon to 2.30 in the afternoon usually is optimum. And uh, don't let your bees get out of hand and split on their own, and that's what would happen if you waited until you see the queen cells. I recommend not waiting until you see the queen cells. If you want to keep your colony from splitting and swarming out on their own without your intervention, potentially losing up to 70% of the stock from that colony. So instead of waiting, when you see the population building, before they've got to the point where they're going to split on their own and they start building queen cells, you can pull frames of brood that are open and that there are eggs present and that have nurse bees on those frames. And then optimally, you want to have drawn comb in the hive box that you're gonna put them in. So if you're a brand new beekeeper, as described here, you may not have a bunch of extra deep frames with drawn out cells in them. So what on earth would you do? There used to be one piece plastic pre-drawn stuff called permacomb. And uh, I understand that stuff is no longer available. I did some moderate testing of that. I wasn't super excited about it. But one thing that we know works really well in kicking off a starter colony is Better Comb. And that comes from Better Bee. There is another website. So you can Google it and look for Better Comb. Those might be on sale today, for example, or even through the weekends. So you want to jump in and see if that stuff is being sold. And then uh, you can stockpile that and be ready for spring. So if you've got drawn comb, like better comb, or if you've got frames that you extracted, most people are extracting medium supers, so medium frames. Those aren't great for obviously starting off a new brood box, which would have deep frames. And I don't want to confuse everyone, but some people also use only medium boxes for all of their hive equipment, and that's because it's 100% interchangeable and they're only worried about one size frame and there's no deeps and mediums and you need deeps but you only have mediums, you need mediums but you only have deeps and so on. That's why you need to be well stocked come spring so you can take action based on what you find. So when should you do the split? You want to, the early bees, the early production, like at the leading edge of a nectar flow, is when your bees are building up the most so they can take advantage of that. I recommend you expand the existing colony so they have a super on so they're not encouraged to go ahead and swarm on their own so they have space and they can work up into that space. Instead of doing your split right away, which some people can do that, but I'm thinking if you're going to want optimal nourishment, optimal nutrition in that hive when they produce that new queen from the eggs that you're going to give them, then uh, you want that to be in the middle of the nectar flow. After the bees are, there's new bees, there are new, healthy, super, what do you want to say, super motivated nurse bees that are in there just really feeding everything. And how do you know if your colony is already well set and ready to make a new queen? How do you know that their nutrition is optimal when you're looking at the brood frame? When you're looking at the eggs, would you see a bunch of... Uh, Royal jelly around the egg? No, you wouldn't. Because the eggs hatch on the third day, and that's when they release their little feed me pheromone that the nurse bees respond to. Then they start putting royal jelly in there. All casts of bees, the drones, the workers, and new queens get royal jelly for at least the first three days. So when you look into that hive and you look into the cells and you see where the larvae are, and if you see the larvae are just swimming in that milky, Queen, you know, if they're full of food, then you know that that colony is ready to raise a really healthy queen. So, and a lot of people um, just jump the gun and start splitting things before everything is kicked in. 
and it needs to be coming from the environment, not feed that you're putting in there. Although the feed that you're putting in there, if you put pollen patties on and things like that in spring, I don't personally do it, but if you did it, then you would be boosting your colony strength, but I would not consider that the time to have them produce replacement queens on their own. And then this is where the genetic part comes in, right? These bees are so fantastic. I want these genetics. This is where it can be disappointing because the new queen that they make, although she might be fat and healthy and she's come from your colony, she's going to go out and she's going to mate with some random drones at the drone congregation area. How she finds this congregation area, we don't know. And the drones tend to find the virgin queen, by the way. So the other thing is, early in the year, you don't see a lot of drones, which means lower drone competition. And in my mind, what I want to see is, and why we wait until that nectar flow is going full bore, is when you see every one of your colonies of bees in your backyard apiary, or you're talking to fellow beekeepers and they've all got drones headed out, that's when you want to put your new virgin queens out because we want maximum competition. We want the fastest, strongest, most capable drones to be breeding with your virgin queens when they go out. So just food for thought, you know, there are different ways to do it. And when you, okay, now I sometimes buy in queens, rarely. I bought one in last year. I got a package last year and one queen from Bee Weaver last year. Now they go through, unless you're obtaining your queen locally, uh, you risk your queens being stressed and injured in some way in transit. And some of the injuries that queens sustain aren't visible. It's not so conspicuous. When you look at them in their little queen cage when they come in, uh, you may not know that they got exposed to higher temperatures in transit or something like that, or really cold temperatures in transit, things that can impact fertility on the queen. So if you're getting a queen and you can get one sourced locally, you're going to be ahead there. If you make your own queen, you're going to be ahead there too. But if you want to absolutely know the genetics, you got to get your queen from a seller. Because when you release them, you're relying on drones in the area having the traits that you want. But locally adapted bees that have just made it through winter, that are doing well, and they're producing drones from colonies that were winter strong, I think that's good genetic stock. For your replacement. I hope I didn't uh, put out too much conflicting information with that answer. Question number two. Tim and Vicki, Fergus, Ontario. My wife and I are now new to beekeeping and we'll start next spring with a flow two plus. So that's a flow hive two plus. Like that's a flow hive two over there and the plus has aluminum legs supporting it very little change. The new tray that goes in is a little better. So if you want to know about that, I'll put a link in the video description. We have a couple of questions for you after we empty the flow frames from last time. So the flow frames are the mechanized frames that the honey comes out of the back and they get stored for winter. So after we empty the flow frames for the last time, if we put them out in a robbing station, having ensured that the majority of the bees have first been removed, are we running the risk that robber bees could introduce disease to the frames, which could then be spread to our bees the following year? Okay, so let's go. Let's start with that. It's a two-part question. So here's what I like to do with your flow supers. Once you've done your last harvest of the year, when you pull them off, first of all, you can get your bees out of it by using an escape board underneath your flow super because you're pulling it off for the winter time. It's not going back. But once the bees are out of it, once you've finished the harvest and gotten everything out of your flow super, I recommend putting it back right on the exact same colony that you took it off of without a queen excluder, letting the bees clean that up for another day or two because they won't start storing a bunch of stuff. They're in cleanup mode. We're winding down the end of the year. And then put your skateboard under it, get the bees out of it, go straight to storage. I wouldn't put the flow supers. I've done it in the past. Uh, but I've rethought that through the years that I'd like to have the same colony that it came off of doing the cleanup on flow frames specifically. And then they go straight to storage for next year. The next question here is regarding varroa mite systems that use CO2 instead of alcohol as a way to remove the mites for counting. The advantage is that the bees are momentarily anesthetized and not killed. We're wondering if you have had any experience with these systems and what your thoughts are. First of all, 
I've never actually seen the CO2 system for knocking out varroa mites in the bees so you can do a varroa count. I do have the little CO2 uh, tanks, but actually I bought them. Uh, they're part of a tire emergency tire repair kits. And uh, then I just used tiny Tupperware cups with sealable lids. And then I drilled a little tiny like 16th inch diameter hole that the little uh, like a, a ball filler needle would go in and then I blow that into the container to knock them out but for a completely different reason that's I don't do that for varroa mite counting I do that to knock out the bees so I can put it under a microscope and then video it as it comes back to life and starts moving its appendages and things like that so I just gave away a creative secret on how to get your bees under control so you can get really close-up macro video and photography so what I would say, but if somebody has a CO2 system specifically designed for that, please put that down in the video comment section below this. I'd like to look at that system because I've never seen one. And if it really is designed to knock out bees, you can do my counts. That's something I'd like to add to my list of things to test coming up. But if you don't want to kill the bees, uh, stuff that's commonly practiced right now would be the powdered sugar, sugar roll, sugar shake method. And then you're not at risk. Um, of killing your queen and things like that so and some people very experienced people have actually made the mistake of alcohol washing their queen so if you want to fail safe especially when you're new to beekeeping um, and you're not comforted if you haven't found the queen and set her aside while you're doing collecting your nurse bees off of those uh, brood frames because that's where the queen's gonna be too she's laying eggs she's on the brood frames then uh, Powdered sugar is a good safety net because then if she at least shows up in there, you can get her out and put her back in and save her. Not destroy the queen. That's a very interesting question though. And now I have to look up that CO2 system to learn more about it. Question number three, Janine Gilpin. Hi Fred, I have a Flow Hive 2 with the metal grate and the plastic tray with compartments. I pulled the tray out yesterday and a lot of mold was growing on it. Last check was about three weeks. I did stay with oil because I heard it traps mites, etc. New beekeeper, Snowy Mountains, Australia. I think there was a movie called Snowy Mountain, Australia. Anyway, um, it is common when you pull out trays underneath the bottom of flow hives or any hive that has a base on it. And this is something I've talked about with uh, manufacturers of beekeeping equipment. You know why? Because you know what I really want to see? If we had a screen bottom board, number eight screen generally, uh, and the screen is on the bottom board that your bees are going to walk over and everything else, guess what falls through it all the time and gets out of reach of the bees? First of all, they're losing pollen off of their legs because they're just bumping into each other and they can't reclaim it. And, you know, they're just clumsy when it comes to bringing in big loads of pollen sometimes. Falls through those openings, goes into the tray, but usually what's under there is not a tray, but rather core flute, you know, that corrugated plastic insert. It's the stuff that political posters, campaign posters, and things like that are made out of. And uh, then that gets sprayed with Pam's cooking spray or something like that. But with the flow hives, what they have is an enclosure underneath the screen. And they have a tray that's compartmentalized. Oh, let me just get this for you afterthought this is what the compartmentalized tray looks like and these are really handy and i would like to see trays like this under all kinds of screen bottom boards not just the flow hive stuff so if we could get trays that match and fit in there then you've got the screen above it and these get to be removed you can clean this out and everything else you can do your mite counts down here and as mentioned here some people put oil in them that's why it's compartmentalized by the way because hives are tilted towards the landing board, this handle part is in the back of the hive. So if they're tilted like this, if there weren't dividers in here, all of the liquid that's down here would just go to the front and then this would have no liquid back here. So it's pretty well thought out. And this is the old design tray. The new one is even better, but it's kind of off yellow. And what collects up in here? It, you know, the pollen that falls off, bits of wax. When the bees are doing maintenance inside the hive, you'll find bits of propolis and everything else down here. But what's that going to plus moisture and condensation uh, occurs in there. So you have to clean these up. 
And this was interesting too, because when this new uh, dead bee thing came out, they have this, which is for scraping the snow off the landing board, but guess what else it's great for? Scraping out the trays in your inserts for underneath your flow hives. So I would like to see other hives, not just flow hives, but other hive configurations with screen bottom boards with a tray that goes in like this and with the ability to close it off in the back. Because for example, when we have the plastic inserts that go in there, the core flute, uh, what happens is if you're doing oxalic acid vaporization, you also have to seal that off. And so it makes it less convenient. So I'd like to see the bottom boards, if they're screen bottoms, also to be enclosed. So now we get the benefit of integrated pest management. I'm not a fan of screen bottom boards and then nothing underneath of them. Because everything that's going on in that hive, especially when there's a nectar flow on and things like that, uh, robber bees and raiders and wasps and things like that can fly under it and smell it and they actually collect underneath there too. Not only that, detritus that's inside the hive, those pollen bits and things like that, if you have an open screen bottom board with nothing underneath it to collect anything, it falls on the ground and now you're attracting pests too. So I like the idea of a contained bottom board if you've got a removable insert or a tray and trays are at the top of the chart for me. So. And the other option is, of course, just a solid bottom board, tilted towards the landing board, and no tray or screen underneath. But, yeah, clean that out. And uh, for removing the oil, uh, so if you've got cooking oil, I like to use mineral oil. Why on earth would I put mineral oil in there? And that's because I like to see what's actually in it. And uh, cooking oil, Crisco, and things like that uh, mess up the little creatures that you find down there. Where if it's mineral oil, you have clear view of what is in it so and then i clean it out with dawn ultra so that was question number three question number four brad wamesley i've read after watching your later posted videos where you do not currently use a queen excluder on any of your flow hives i decided not to use an excluder next year on my flow box but then came across this video where the queen did get up into the flow frames to lay her eggs. Was this because you didn't use a honey bridge, medium super, between the brood box and the flow frames as I believe you mentioned in some of your videos? I like you am into beekeeping, not for honey, great bonus, but rather what I can learn about bees and becoming a better beekeeper as you may have guessed. I am going back through and watching all your videos on beekeeping. Thank you for going back and looking at the old videos. So the video that we're talking about here, and there's a reason why the queen was up in the flow super and why she laid eggs. Why? Because I was giving the flow hive components the shakedown. In the Navy, they have something called a shakedown cruise, and that's when you're given some kind of equipment, yeah, like a fast boat or something and you run it at flank speed and you do maximum maneuvers and you see what it can take and you really push the limits red line it you know what i'm saying so anyway that's what i was doing to the flow hive so i took the flow hives and i did everything to them that you're not supposed to because i wanted to find out what's going on and that's in 2016 by the way yeah 2016. so i had the flow hive had the flow frames and uh, some people had speculated because can you imagine when a new piece of honeybee keeping equipment came out Everybody speculated on exactly how it would and would not work and what it could and couldn't do. And, uh, but I decided to do practical testing. So what I did was, and nobody should do it because I violated what the company that designed it, the flow company, um, I used it in a way that you weren't supposed to. So number one, I took the queen excluder out. Why? Cause I'm going to leave it on over winter. You know, there were people that actually said if plastic sits out, over winter, those frames will fail. In other words, it's going to destroy the plastic because it went through freeze cycles in the wintertime. And I thought, oh, that's weird. That can't be right. But I also wanted to know because other people said the cells are too large, the cells are too deep, and a queen honeybee isn't going to lay her eggs in cells that are that deep and that large. And guess what size these cells are? They're actually a little larger than worker cells and a little smaller than drone cells. 
and I think that's intentional on the part of the inventors. And the depth, because remember, there's only seven of those frames to match up with 10 frames in a Langstroth box. Same size box, 10 frames Lang, seven flow super frames. So then let's, how do we answer those questions? We expose the bees to it, we give them full access to it, and we find out, can a queen lay eggs in there? So that's the video that's being referenced here. I show that the queen did lay eggs in it because we took away the queen excluder because you can't have a queen excluder on in wintertime. Your bees need to access all of the resources. So the flow super was never pulled for winter. They laid eggs. So then the next argument was the claim ahead of time by people who didn't even own the flow supers, didn't own flow hives. Uh, those will all be drones, they said, with absolution. If they lay eggs, those are gonna be drone eggs. There's no question, look at the size of the cells. Well, there were no drones in the one that I showed. Those were workers that were hatching out. And then it wasn't even the end of the world for the flow super because then you just take the queen excluder and uh, put it back in. Once you validate that the queen is down below, put the queen excluder right under that flow super that had been through winter and the bees clean out um, the sugar and stuff. Now here was the other problem. The workers hatch out and they can go down through the queen excluder. Had they been drones in those cells, they would be trapped above the queen excluder and wouldn't have been able to get out at all. So you would have them and you would know that you produced drones in those cells, but they weren't. They were workers, all of them. So then, but the other part of it was we fed that colony heavy sugar syrup going into winter because we drew off their resources, 100% of them. Again, remember, flank speed, full test. Not what you should do because we should have left more honey in that, but we drained all of them at once to see what would happen. That's why the bees evacuated and collected on the front, and then the bees inside were left to clean up the mess we made. So that meant after the final harvest, we had to put two to one sugar syrup on to get those bees through winter. So, and they did, they survived winter. But what they did was they stored the sugar and the sugar crystallized. So there were actually clumps of sugar in the cells. And you would think in the springtime, if we leave that on, the bees will go up there and they'll clean out that sugar. But what was going on? A new nectar flow. So when there's a new nectar flow, they ignore the old stuff. So they weren't even cleaning out the sugar up there. They were bringing in new nectar. They were storing new honey and they were doing that down below. So you had to take it apart, and that's where we said, now you have to power wash it with warm water. So I laid out 200 feet of garden hose in the sun, let the sun warm the, the water in the garden hose, and then we just had hot water to wash them out, put them back in, and we were back in business with the functional flow hive. So now that I've explained why I was a renegade and did all of that to find out what they could and couldn't do, and now we have that knowledge, so we know what can happen. So I decided to use an excluder next year, then came across this video. Was this because you didn't use the honey bridge? True, I did not use the honey bridge because I had not figured that out yet. Medium super between the upper and then uh, let's sell us like you. I'm into beekeeping. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So what I am going to do is show you the configuration that I've arrived at after all these years with flow hives because this comes up a lot, especially with new beekeepers. Uh, they have troubles getting the bees to work the flow super, the flow frames. And, uh, but I suspect that you would have problems with some of those colonies because same thing happened to me. First year with flow supers, I put a flow hive on a flow super, not the whole flow hive, but just a flow super on a colony of bees. And I thought, well, they'll just go up there and they'll take care of everything. They did diddly, they didn't do anything. But then I had another hive two hives over, doing really well, high population of bees, maybe it's the colony. Maybe they're not strong enough. Maybe they can't store enough resources. So I took that super off of this one and I put it on that one and they filled it right up. So sometimes your colony of bees might be undermanned. They might not be able to bring in enough. But I'm gonna show you what I arrived at. And this is what we mean by the honey bridge because this all came to me because I didn't want to use Queen excluders, because queen excluders are often honey excluders. And when it comes to queen excluders, by the way, I did my own practical tests. I put queen excluders on top of open feeders to see how easily bees were getting through it or not. And I was really amazed at how much the worker honeybees had to struggle 
to get through the Queen Excluder to access a free, you know, sugar meal that I was putting out for them. So that's what led me to this. So this is what we arrived at today. So now when you're looking at Flow Hives, you don't have to buy the whole Flow Hive. Those things are expensive. You can just buy a Flow Super and put it on a regular Langstroth 8 frame or 10 frame, 6 frame Super or 7 frame Super corresponds. So this is what I've learned to date. All of my hives now have landing boards with entrances that are at least 18 inches off the ground because predators can't get in there. This is my entrance reducer here on a reversible solid bottom board. That's also my preferred bottom board, unless it comes with that Flow Hive Plus because it has a tray in it. Then above that, what do I have? I've also decided to put slatted racks on all my hives just for utility, if nothing else. Plus, if you're collecting a swarm of bees and you dump them in a hive, you got a slatter rack at the bottom, the swarm goes down to the bottom and then you can still put all your frames in right away. So then we've got either an eight or 10 frame, whatever your chosen gear is. So this is your brood box, right? Brood, honey, pollen, first deep box. So this is your setup. Now, nothing goes above this point when you're just getting your colony started out. But once they fill this, what's considered full? Eight out of 10 frames, if they're full and the population is good and lots of activity, lots of pollen coming in, that's when you put on your medium super. If you put the medium super on too early, they'll migrate up into it and they'll start filling that with honey early before they have finished building their brood area. And also you risk running brood up here. So you have to let this deep Langstroth box fill first, then put your medium super on. Then when that's 80% or more, so eight out of 10 frames or more with honey either capped or nearly capped, that's when you can put that flow super on up here without the queen excluder over here. This is what I refer to as the honey bridge. So this box has nothing but honey in it. Now, if you get one of those super colonies down here that does a little arch up here and you've got some of the brood up into this medium box, this is not your honey bridge anymore. Now you have to add another medium above it, which I did not show in this illustration, but you would potentially have two mediums now. And then the upper medium would be nothing but honey before you put on this flow super. That's if you're trying to avoid using the queen excluder. And if you choose to follow my example and skip using a queen excluder, you should know you risk having your queen get up in there if she runs out of space down below, she could lay her eggs in the flow super because we proved that she could do it. Now what happens? Uh, you made that mistake. You followed my advice. And now look, you've got brood up in your flow hive. You know, good job, Fred, right? So now it's not the end of the world. You let your queen go back down below. You find her during one of those great inspections that you're doing. There's the queen. You're going to mark her or whatever. Which next year is blue for the queen marker. So if you don't have those yet, get your blue paint pens ready to go. Anyway, so once she's down below, then you put that queen excluder back in. You just can't harvest any honey off of it yet. And then whatever eggs she laid up there, they're gonna hatch, they're gonna develop, they're gonna hatch, they're gonna be out of there. And then they're gonna return that and restore it to honey stores. It's just gonna take longer to fill up with the queen excluders in. But when I don't have queen excluders on those things, once that honey bridge is established, I've had them fill that. I've drawn off the honey from the flow super and 11 days later, all of those cells have been filled and capped again. Now, is that scalable? Is that something a commercial beekeeper is gonna to wanna to do? The flow high people probably wouldn't like it that I say this, but I say absolutely not. It's not commercial scale beekeeping because let's be honest, I can harvest from 15 or 20 hives I can pull all those boxes off, you know, one day go out there, put all the escape boards underneath all the supers, come back the next day, pull all the supers off and go right into extracting while I'm sitting out there with my cup of coffee. Coffee Arosto, by the way, which comes from the West Coast of the United States, fresh roasted coffee beans. Anyway, so you're sitting out there drinking your coffee, your grandkids are sitting around and we're watching honey come out of the flow hive. Well, that... Frame by frame, we only do two or three frames at a time. 
And uh, we're out there for 40 minutes. Unless the hotter the day, of course, the faster it runs out. You have to tip your hive back two degrees. So is it faster to have a flow hive or to do traditional extracting, uncapping, spinning, filtering? Well, if you're in bulk, if you're really trying to expand and you're trying to make money off your honey and you need a lot of honey to do it, you're going to want to go traditional. You're not going to want to use the flow frames, but see, now I'm going to mess you up a little. Studies were done by Queens, the University of Queensland, by the way, and they taste tested honey and honey coming out of flow frames because they're not smoking the bees. They're not running that honey through a processor that might have different metals in it. All these different surfaces, all this different exposure, all the air that mixes in with it when you go through traditional extraction. Take a look at some people's honey houses where they're processing their honey, the hot house ahead of time, where they're warming all their boxes, and then look at the honey house and tell me if it looks like a sanitary place to you. Because, I mean, the argument is honey's antibacterial anyway. Not only that, what's going on? They're putting all the honey together, and that's the whole point of when you're extracting, when you're uncapping and you're spinning it, you're consolidating all the honey from all the frames that you've harvested into huge vats, and you're pumping that through a system for processing. You're going to filter it, screen it, whatever their requirement is, if they can leave pollen in it and so on, but without getting into all the detail, look at these facilities, look at the people there, and tell me if anything can be getting into your honey. Is it open? Are a lot of these surfaces wide open? So what they found was when they did the studies, not just the Queensland study, which was about flavor and scent and professional honey tasters were used as part of that study. Um, there were other studies done to see what's in suspension in honey, what uh, shows up. And they find that uh, there are fibers contributed to the honey, which come from clothes worn by beekeepers and things like that, which let's backtrack. If we're coming straight out of a flow hive because you're a backyard beekeeper, you got time in your hands, you're just going to sit there and, and a couple of gallons of honey is all you're after. That's when it's for you because it comes right out of the frame and it goes straight into the jar with no intermediate processing at all. And it doesn't get aerated. It doesn't get blended with all the other frames in that same box. And let me tell you something, when it comes springtime and you look at the back of a flow hive, you, they have transparent ends on them. And I know some people are leaving this video right now just because they even mentioned Flow Hive because somehow people get triggered by it. And it's really, got, it's just, I don't understand today why this is one of the most polarizing inventions in beekeeping. But anyway, you look through these clear panels on the back and you get to see the color of the honey. And then you see a bunch of these side by side and you'll see the clover honey will be really light. And then you'll see the next frame of honey is a little different and not just that the scent and the flavor of each frame of honey especially in spring because what's happening in spring you're starting off there's a rapid progression of nectar and pollen sources out in the environment at least where I live so it's wide and varied because it's wild these aren't planted resources just for the bees right so spring is when I see the greatest progression of the differences of nectar coming in and uh, that's preserved frame by frame, half a gallon jar from this frame, half a gallon jar from this frame. And we set those on the kitchen table and you see all the differences and you can taste and smell the differences too. Now, I'm not one of those connoisseurs that can taste the honey and go, hmm, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Is it mint? I don't know. Is that a maple tree? I don't, you know, I don't know what it's coming from. I'm not good at that. I do like to walk around in the environment and see what the bees are on. You know, I love it when dandelions bloom. And even though that's a deficient protein pollen wise, there's also nectar coming from dandelions and things like that. So you might have some dandelion honey blend going on there. Cosmos this year, at the end of the year, really changed the flavor of the honey. It, it was very strong honey. So again, all these things are preserved frame by frame as a progression through spring. So that is a vote for honey. And like I said, honey that is unique and they found those flavors and preservation to be more favorable 
than honey that have been through other processing. When you smoke a hive, poof, 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 even light smokes, because every time we inspect a hive, a lot of people just use smoke to do it. So you should really think carefully about the smoker fuel that you're using. Because even though all of my smokers have spark arresters built into them, they're not open from the, from the burn chamber through the cone, and then so that you could blow sparks and stuff. You ever get it really going and see sparks flying out the end of your smoker? Those are particulates, and those particulates go into the hive, go on the frames, and get into your honey as well, because people smoke when they're extracting honey, when they're pulling frames, pulling boxes. So smoke has also been one of the most predominant particulates, soot and ash, have been found in the honey. How it gets there is totally up for debate because, you know, some of the honey's capped, some of it isn't. A lot of commercial guys look for an 80% capped frame, which means that 20% of that frame is not capped, which means when you're heavy smoking everything because your bees are really mad because you're moving fast through the colonies and things like that, uh, the particulates from your smoke impact the flavor of the honey that you're going to use. But if it's commercial and you're going to heat it, and you're going to pasteurize it, and you're going to run it through all of these post-processing stages, then that doesn't matter anyway, because it's going to be filtered out. See what I'm saying? So there are differences that inform decisions here. So I realized I took this question as an opportunity to talk about other things to consider, because that's what we're about. We have the time. We're backyard beekeepers. I, don't, I have to be honest, I don't know how commercial beekeepers... I don't have they have the time to make a YouTube. Ian Stepler in Canada? How does that guy have the time to even sit down and share what he does? He doesn't just do bees, he does other stuff. And it's an, it's incredible. Cayman Reynolds, you would think he would just be exhausted and he would just flop on the couch somewhere, but no, he's out there on, you know, Thanksgiving talking about uh how his wife kept bees before he did, and he's looking at the back the back lot area where she kept her bees. Where do you get the time? At, the, at that time, I had three grandkids tearing up the house over here, moving furniture around and chasing each other everywhere and eating the stuff I want. Anyway, I'm sorry. I was on a rant. Moving on. Backyard beekeepers are supposed to have the time to languish and sit around and stare at bees and, and get emotionally supported by their proximity to the bees, sitting next to a hive of bees and listening to the noises they make and watching them come and go and knowing that they're prospering is extremely healthy. It is like medicine, which is why we have, I'm gonna plug them while I'm thinking about it, Hives for Heroes, because it helps people that suffer the stress of war and conflict and they can come back and if they can learn to manage bees, unless bees are a trigger and scares people, that's not for you. But people that understand nature and appreciate being by themselves and like to sit next to bees and interact with them, the more you know, uh, then the more soothing it is. I'll bet they could hook you up to a bunch of diagnostic equipment and it's probably already been done because the nature fix is real, by the way. People that go out and just engage in nature, they find that it actually causes their bodies and minds to be healthy. Your creativity is better than it normally is. Did you know that? living, being in nature, under trees and things like that. And I realize some people live in cities, they don't have access to it. That's why city parks and green spaces are so important. It's healthy to do that. But it's a lie. I don't have any time. That, that's like I was saying, these guys, how do they have time? I don't know. This question comes from DP. Question number five. I'm dealing with this at the moment. My hive is quite big, but it appeared... Their defenders had already been defeated when I spotted the invasion. I have completely closed the hive as it is a cooler day with a wood strip. And the invaders lost interest within an hour and a half. I removed the timber strip and to clean up the, and the cleanup crew came out from my hive and it was returning to normal traffic. But the invaders returned the next day and the mesh is a good idea. I'm about to try it so I don't smother another hive. And that's good to know because there are a couple of things at play here. Once a beehive, any resource, by the way, once the scouts go out, 
They get past the guards on a landing board if they find any resource. What do they do? The scouts get a sample of the resource, they fly back. If that resource is favorable, they go to the dance floor inside your hive on the comb. And that dance floor, by the way, is pretty consistent. It's pretty much the same spot. So foragers that are waiting for an assignment, for something they like, for a job to do, they're waiting at the dance floor for the scouts to come back and bring back the sample. And if they like it, they go out. So now they also waggle based on how much of the resource is there. So if there's a lot, if they get into a hive past the guards, they determine it's queenless or weak or in decline or whatever the reason is, why well, they could get in there and get a sample of the nectar that's stored in there or the honey that's stored in there. And they get back with that. And then they come back triple fold. The reason I mention this is they have great memories. Bees are the biggest brained insects. Once they find a resource, they will fly out there in cold weather because it's a known source. They know its location and they're going to head for it. When your colony is being robbed, you need to have something ready to stop the robbing. And it should not, as mentioned here, putting a wood strip over, I understand because it stops the robbing, right? Have something handy. If you're looking for a gift for your beekeeper or you're the beekeeper, get this gift for yourself. This is probably the most popular and most widely used robbing screen. It's plastic. It has tabs that break off. So it works for a 10 frame or an eight frame hive. This one has the instructions in the back. If people ask about robbing, this is what I tell them about because you can have these just stored. It's lightweight. It doesn't take up any space really. Not only that, when you put it on the front of the hive, how do you attach it to the hive? Those pins are right there. You pull these out and you stick them in and you stick it to the hive and then you open this top piece one at a time. Don't do both sides. They're being attacked one at a time. And here's what you'll notice because this works. And this is part of sitting around drinking your coffee, staring at your bees. Watch the guards come back. They have no clue how to get into this hive. So they just keep going right to the center. Meanwhile, your resident bees will be coming up the inside surface of this, which by the way is rough so they can get their footing. They come out the top and they learn to orient and get out that way. Meanwhile, your robbers are frustrated here. You can't take this off once the hive has been pegged as a source for robbing. They don't stop robbing it until something changes with the entrance or until suddenly those bees get super strong. And one of the ways you can make them stronger is by reducing, not closing the entrance. So you can reduce that entrance as small as possible. Here's an example of how small the entrance would be, 3 8 of an inch tall and about one inch in width. 3 8 by one inch and hopefully they can defend that. But this in a pinch because you're not going to pull and replace the entrance reducer usually. Most people don't have those on the shelf ready to go. You can have these on the shelf ready to go. The other part of this too is people are going into winter time now and one of the concerns is mice getting in. So this has pins here that go right here and it's the height of the pin. If this were to go through that little corner piece, this little space at the bottom lets the bees go in and out, but mice can't get under it. It's plastic. They'll chew it, right, Fred? I've not seen one chew these yet. I've not seen a mouse chew through it because that mouse has to sit out there and chew for a long time to get its opening. But uh, be smart robbing screens. I always have those handy because that works and for the next couple of weeks you're going to see the same robbers showing up trying to get in there their numbers will reduce but they haven't forgotten what a great resource they found and at the top of their list for resources would be honey why because if they can get honey out of that hive and get it back to their hive that is one to one ready to go no further processing needed so it is the biggest bang for their foraging buck that they can find. That's why they're so intense and frenzied about it. That's why they're willing to die trying to get to it. So I hope that answers that question number five there. Now we're on to number six. Joel from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I have a question on mite treatments. Several weeks ago, I did a sugar roll on two hives and both came up with zero mites. Then a few weeks ago, I followed up with an alcohol wash on the two and got one mite on one hive and a total of three on the other. 
So usually when people are doing a mite wash or they're doing a sugar shake and things like that, they're scooping up half a cup of bees. Why is that? Because usually that means 300 bees. So if we had three mites from 300 bees, what do we have? A 1% occupation of mites. That's pretty low. That's pretty darn good. A lot of people would be happy to have that. I hear that we should treat prophylactically. Others say, don't treat if you don't need to. I'm concerned if I do and if I don't. I had planned on picking a swarm. Oh, I'm sorry. I plan on picking a warm December day to do an OAV treatment, which is oxalic acid vaporization. But uh, don't want to do it if I don't need to. What would you do? Okay, so that's the question. What would you do? So if I had a colony of bees, first of all, some people say treat prophylactically. That means treat all your colonies, whether you see the mites or not, why bother doing mite counts? Just get out there and OAV all those hives. Uh, depending on the time of year, that has some merit. But here's one of the reasons why, along with your record keeping, which needs to be very detailed because through the years, you don't know how many years you're going to keep bees, do you know that among new beekeepers, 80% of new beekeepers quit at the end of their second year of beekeeping? 80%. That's in the United States, by the way. So I don't know about the world, you know, what those percentages are. But it's because the first year seems really good. You load up your bees, you do really well, they get through winter, you didn't treat, you didn't have to do anything, they just survived. You must have awesome stock and everything else. And the second year, they seem to do okay but they're kind of in decline and you don't really know why they're in decline and things like that. And then following your second winter, that spring, you lose all of your colonies or some disaster like that happens. And you're like, man, I spent so much money on those bees. That's it, I'm out. So they quit. Often people quit because there aren't good mentors out there. There aren't people that can help carry them through and help them assess colonies. And I'm gonna move back into this question here now. So what would I do? Well, keep a record of your colony that had the lowest mites. So because you get a colony here with zero mites. And then at a time of year, this is why fall is alarming to a lot of people. Because if you have a warm enough day, when you can get in there, when you can scoop your bees, and when you can do a varroa mite count, you know, once the, the environment has stopped producing and things are winding down, what else is winding down? your brood inside your hives is in decline. Therefore, you've got more nurse bees concentrated over smaller brood cells. Your queen, who responds to the stimulus of how many resources are coming through, pollen and good nectar, right? If that's coming through and that's in decline, then now your queen starts to reduce her laying, which means if you've got a lot of varroa mites where just five or six weeks earlier, you did counts and the count numbers were really low, but then people get alarmed because later they go to the brood frames, which keep in mind the brood frames are smaller now. So what's happening there? The varroa destructor mites that would have been spread out through several frames are now concentrating their activity on just a few frames where the brood still remains and they're attacking the nurse bees on those frames. This is why it's so critical to get the varroa mites under control before the decline, before the brood is concentrating and dwindling and getting smaller because what you're doing is you're providing food resources for the mites on those nurse bees right in that concentrated area and then there are fewer pupa therefore when they're entering the pupa state just before they're capping those brood cells the varroa mites are getting in there now instead of one mite every 10 brood cells or something like that we've got several mites in a single brood cell. And that's why the winter brood is profoundly impacted by varroa mites that are out of control. So the good news is, since you did this mite wash recently, well, it says uh, a few weeks ago. So let's see, we're mid uh, November here. So late October, those numbers are actually very good. Uh, because they're going to continue to decline going into the end of uh, November, beginning of December. Those are here where I live in the state of Pennsylvania, northeastern United States. This is the time period where we have the smallest brood pattern 
of the year. So if we have really tiny mite numbers, so do you sit around and stress about it? Do you just worry that are the mites getting hold of my winter bees, my fat bodied winter bees that are supposed to be able to start the brood in the spring for us? We can't let them suffer the aggression from these ferrodestructor mites. So the question is, remember, what would I do? Well, the end of November is coming up. So here's what the gauge is going to be for me. I've already documented low high mite count colonies, right? So now, uh, oxalic acid vaporization, let's talk about how it works. It only works on phoretic mites, mites that are intermediate to their reproductive cycle. So they're on the bodies of bees generally. So now that means they're exposed because oxalic acid vaporization does not work through brood caps. So if we have the smallest brood of the year, we have the most exposure of the mites, our target animal, the varrodestructor mite, little arachnids with their eight legs just clamoring around trying to bite into the, your precious bees. I personally would hit them up on a warm day. What's a warm day? If it hits the mid 60s at any time in the last week of November to the first week of December, I would hit them with oxalic acid vaporization because that is going to be more than 90% efficacious. That is going to take out 90% of phoretic mites. At least that's conservative. That's pretty much guaranteed. And it's a single treatment. So you hit them one time. So keep the records of which colonies were doing good, which colonies have the low mite counts. And if you've got a ProVap or something like that, because here's the, here's the beauty of that treatment, by the way. We already have great stock here, by the way. So it's great stock. Those are good numbers this time of year. So uh, the treatment is not going to hurt your bees. A one-time treatment, and you don't have to take the cover off. You don't have to take the inner cover off. You don't have to put some kind of patties like Formic Pro on there, which you would not be doing this time of year. And uh, it basically is the only option for treatment of destructor mites this time of year if you're in an area where winter comes in a meaningful way and takes everything down to freezing temperatures. So when we get those breaks, we did it last year. We had a, a couple of warm days right at the end of November, beginning of December, and I gave them a single treatment. My wife and I went out there and we just did all the hives, every single one of them. Uh, because they're also flying like crazy right then. See, so they get these weird warm ups in the middle of winter. There's lots of flight going on. The risk of the bees migrating to one another's colonies exists. Therefore, backyard beekeepers, I'm not talking, remember this is not commercial, Backyard beekeepers, you know, a handful of hives in your own yard. I would treat them all. And that's because, and then what happened unpredictably, last year, some of our most experienced beekeepers here lost huge percentages of their colonies of bees. So, and we always go back to health and nutrition, good stock, varroa destructor mite levels. The varroa destructor mite does more than scoot around and just feed on your bees. Uh, they pass on pathogens. They pass on disease. And once you see them, you don't want them around. In fact, I want to put a link down to show you what varroa destructor mites look like on your frames. Uh, because I showed them in macro close and I want you to look at them and I want you to see them in scale with a developing pupa. And I want you to see how big that, that's like a parasite on you the size of a cat. And once you see it, you'll be very active, I think, about dealing with those mites. But again, this is just what I say. That's not necessarily a threshold that mandates treatment. Because this time of year, you would expect to see much higher numbers than that because of the reduced brood and all the reasons that I just described. So for Joel, personally, what would I do? Treat them. Keep records. Good stock, by the way. Question number seven. This comes from Patty, Coopville, Washington. I am on Whitby Island in Washington State. I have two long lang hives and one eight frame observation long hive, or lang hive, I'm sorry. I'm using a wrap it around feeder with dry sugar. My question is, when I want to add more sugar, the bees are all over the surface of the sugar. How would you suggest I add more sugar? Okay. 
Well, and that happens a lot, by the way. And even when it's cold weather and we're checking on sugar supplies, we usually, I try to have at least be mid fifties, even when I'm looking at sugar stock up there, because uh, the bees don't generally go up in the top, but now see something has changed this year, right? So this year we put on the insulated inner covers. So that's under the rapid round feeders. And then we have insulated sidewalls now for my hive. Some of them, not all of them, because I have to have a comparison. And then we have the insulated outer cover, right? So we open this up. And by the way, this is a yellow rapid round feeder, just for an example. It's not the one I use, I use the white ones. When there's no syrup in here and it's dry feed, this inner cover is off and usually sitting in the feeder shim with your rapid round. So the minute you open your top cover here, to look at your sugar, take this off and put this right over the center hole so we're not evacuating a bunch of nice warm air. So the next question is, now we've got a bunch of bees sitting on the sugar and we want to add sugar because we want to top everything off and we want to move on, but here's these bees right there and they're not getting out of the way. We're not using smoke in the winter time when we're feeding this up. We're not stressing our bees. And we want this to happen as quickly as possible. What could you do to get those bees out of there? This vacuum really sucks. That's a vacuum. This is, you can Google it, it's the Shark Ultra Cyclone Handheld Bee Vac, right? And why did I even pick this thing? Because, see the clear container here? And if you'll notice, it's like a little cyclone thing. And when it sucks as a vacuum, that means it's a winner for the bees because you push this little thing here and we've got this trap door. The bees that you suck up into this thing end up in this little clear tray right here. And I use this for my long Langstroth hive because when you open it, you do your inspections, you're closing everything up, you're putting the cover boards on. We have these straggler bees all over the top, which you end up chasing around and they fly and land right back again. So now I just suck them up with this, but this also works on your sugar. So I've got bees on top of the sugar. Turn this on, vacuum them all up in there. Leave it running, by the way, while they're vacuuming, I just turn it off because it's noisy and annoying. Then you pour your new sugar in there. You pop this open because if it's cold at all, and you just shake those bees right back on there, put the cover back on and move along. You're in business. Anytime you have bees where you don't like them, you got that mean, guard bee that comes and is constantly pinging at your veil or something like that and just won't go away. If you've got a little handheld vac, I'm not saying get this exact one. I have two of these though, because my grandkids use them too. They get guard duty when we're taking honey off and stuff. Suck up that guard bee and let it sit there and do a timeout while you're doing your work and then release it later. That little shark vac is worth its weight in gold and it's, you know, it's on a battery. So there's no cord with you or anything else. That's what I would do. Another option, because that contains them and then you can shake them right back in there, put the lid on and then they're safe, especially if it's cold outside because sometimes when I'm inspecting dry sugar feed on top of the hives, they're, they're in torpor. They're sitting there and then they're barely moving. So those are perfect. You can, just, you can even pick those up with your fingers if you want to, but a bee in torpor can sting you and it's usually very unexpected. So just like come up with your vacuum, put your sugar in, dump it back out, Put the lid on and then you're good to go. That's my tip for the day on that. Plus for people looking for gifts for beekeepers, cordless backs, sucking up even little spiders and stuff that you find. Every hive has a jumping spider. Number eight. This is from Beth from Million, Ohio. Hello, you had mentioned you can spray a package of bees with a OA syrup mixture. And that's oxalic acid again that we're talking about. Can you tell me more about this? Do you recommend a OA syrup spray versus oxalic acid vaporization after day seven or so on install? Started my 2021 with a nuke and getting two packages in 2022. So yeah, when it comes to, here's the thing, not everything works all the time in every circumstance. And when would you not spray your sugar syrup with your oxalic acid on it on a package of bees? Well, when they arrive and they're stressed and they're cold, 
So if, if they've been cold and they've had a tough journey, I don't like to do that, right? The goal is to hive them up as quick as possible as soon as the weather's warm, and then we want to get the queen in there because we want her to be released. So then some people would say, well, Fred, you got them in the package. Just put that package in a tote or something, do an OIV treatment, hit the whole package, and uh, then you're covered and the mites are dead. Well, because here's the thing. Those package bees, and for those of you who don't know, a package of bees comes in a screen box that goes through the mail, and they've also added a laying queen with that package. Those bees are not from that queen. So they're also getting familiar with the queen. So when you get your package, who's been through the mail, who's been through all the stress of shipment and everything else, now you hit them with oxalic acid vaporization and then you turn them loose with a queen in there. Often they can turn on the queen, reject her, and uh, they can sting and kill the queen. They might not accept that queen or you might have to keep her in that cage for a very extended period of time where what I want to do is get them established, get them in the hive, and then this nine day or seven day or so install. Okay, I like to get them in your nucleus colony or in your single deep brood box since you're going to start your package in, usually about three pounds of bees with her. Get the queen in there, let the queen um, get loose, let them eat the sugar plug and release the queen over time. Usually just a couple of days is all it takes to get her out of there. And uh, she's accepted by the bees and she starts laying. Once you see evidence, because that's the other thing too, we don't want to check on her every single day. We don't want to harass a newly installed colony of bees, right? So leave her in there for seven to 10 days. What's the risk? So the queen, let's say she got out on the second day that you put her in there. So then you go to do your inspection after a week, cage is empty, queen's out, you pull it, pull a couple frames really quickly and look, do you have eggs? So once she has started laying eggs, that's why the outside time frame, if it was a perfect situation and they released her immediately and she laid an egg on the first day, you have nine days to give an oxalic acid treatment. Why? Because as I mentioned before, it doesn't work once the pupae are capped. So we have to give the treatment while all of those varroa-destructor mites that might have come with that package, which by the way, you should ask the shipper, did you pre-treat your bees for mites, because a lot of shippers are shipping packaged bees with varroa destructor mites and even small hive beetles. So we just had a, a lecture about small hive beetles from a professor recently. We talked about shipping those things around the country in packages. Anyway, so now they're installed and uh, after you've got seven to ten days there, you want to give them a hit of oxalic acid vaporization because now they won't associate the OA with that queen that they didn't know yet. Now they've committed to the queen. She's got her queen mandibular pheromone going everywhere. They're queen right. They've got eggs. They've got brood going. And then you're hitting them after they've been in this box for a week. So they're settled and they won't abscond because that's the risk too. Rejecting and killing the queen, which they're doomed absolutely, Unless by some miracle she laid some eggs first, but that doesn't happen because if they let her lay eggs, that means they've accepted her and her pheromone is much stronger with brood present. So once brood starts, when do those eggs release their pheromones? After they hatch on the third day. So they're very committed then. And then you can hit them with the oxalic acid and you won't have bees that abscond or turn on the queen and kill her. So it's a safety thing. That's why I don't like to spray the package. Spraying the package, that's less efficacy. You're adding further stress to the bees unless it's super hot. You know, I don't know where you live. So, well, I know where you live. I think this is, okay, in Ohio. But if you're in some desert region or something or you got them on a really hot day, then you could kill two birds with one stone. Spritzing them with sugar syrup and delivering your oxalic acid at the same time and killing mites all at once. And they don't associate that the same way as they do oxalic acid vapor. Vapor can cause them to turn on the queen. The syrup does not. In fact, if you add Honey Bee Healthy to that syrup also, an essential oil, they say that's proven to help with queen acceptance. So there you go. They look at it as a favorable experience instead of something negative to kill their queen over. And now this is question nine. 
This is really not a question, by the way, and it was sent to me anonymously. And it's because during a live chat, somebody asked me what I thought of Premier Foundation. So I'm going to read you this comment that I got anonymously through my website, which is thewaytobe.org. You will have to check out Premier Foundation. The cells are not smaller. The cell walls are thinner. More like the construction of wild hives, is what it says. Maybe you still won't feel there is a value to more cells on the frame, but at least your information will be correct. And I do want my information to be correct. So I, when we're doing the live chat and they asked about Premiere, because they said there's more cells on a frame, I thought they were saying that they're also doing small cell, which is one of the ways that some people try to combat Varroa destructor mites, and that's proven not to work. So I was incorrect about that because I did go to their website afterwards, you know, because live streams were relying on information we already have, different than today, where I can do research. So I went to the Premier website, and I noticed that they did say that they have more cells on the frame, but that the cells are the same size, but the cell walls are thinner. So I have a lot of questions about that. So what am I going to do? What have I done with things like the flow hive and stuff like that? Well, I'm going to get them. So I went ahead and I ordered a bunch of uh, Premier Foundation Heavy Waxed. And we're going to make comparisons. So I'm going to do physical comparisons. I'm going to count those cells because since the claim is, of course, that there's more cells than their competitors, the wax on the foundation is better than their competitors. And uh, this causes the bees to make thinner cell walls. So then, of course, I pulled together with my Fellowship of Master Beekeepers, a great resource of people, by the way, all researchers and so on. So what I want to know is, can we really dictate the thickness of the cell wall of honeybee wax comb by the embossing size on the bottom of the plastic foundation? So there's gonna, we're going to get a lot of these questions answered. But the other thing is, so I'm going to take it through a thorough test. First, we're going to do the physical dimensional examination of this. We're going to compare it to other uh, companies because they don't name the other companies that they're having more cells than. And, uh, of course, the wax is superior to other companies, but we don't know which companies the wax is superior to. So beeswax can also be tested for residue. We can test beeswax for chemical residue, and 99% of all beeswax in the United States test positive for a variety of different agricultural and beekeeper varroa treatment-related chemicals. So these are all things that are easy to assess. So this comment, though anonymous, is correct. I did say that we must be talking about small cell foundation, which has been proven not to work for varroa destructor mite control. But uh, so now it leads me to other aspects. We're going to look at it. If Premier Foundation turns out to be the hottest thing that, that ever came out for beekeeping, uh, and, is, and these thin walls, if you can actually control a bee and the thickness of the wax that they draw out as they make their cells, that's going to be very interesting to me. So I'm not shutting it down for that. I was shutting it down for the idea that it's small cell foundation, how that's supposed to work. The other thing is more cell walls, more frames on a single piece of foundation would not necessarily result in more honey, which is one of the claims, because you would have more cell walls. But if the wall thickness of the cells is actually thinner because the foundation has the ability to dictate to the worker bees that are producing the wax. If you can do an imprint on a piece of plastic and by thinning down the wall of the imprint of the cell cause the bee to create a thinner walled cell, that's very interesting because the bees do their cell wall thicknesses based on resonance and vibration communication in the hive as well. So this is actually going to lead to, and I haven't got back from uh, the other people that have asked for it, but we're going to pull information about this because it's very interesting how they determined that they could change a honeybee's cell wall thickness just by the foundation on the plastic base itself. So that's Premier Foundation. We're going to be testing that coming up and we're going to compare it to other foundations that are out there, including cell wall thickness on the foundation itself 
and whether or not they can actually affect what the bees draw out. So figuring out how to measure the thickness of the wax cell wall, which is pretty soft, by the way. So what we would have to do to get a mechanical dimensional measurement on the cell wall of beeswax, you can't put calipers on it because you might dent the beeswax and get an incorrect reading, right? So you have to freeze those cells or use liquid nitrogen to make that cell wall hard enough so that you can get a mechanical dimensional on it. So that's all coming up. And so I got called out here and I certainly want to be right about what I'm putting out for people. In the live chat, I should have just said, ah, I haven't looked into it, I'm gonna find out more and then I'll get back to you, which is what I really should have done. So that's pretty much it for today. So I wanna thank you for being here. I hope you're having a fantastic holiday weekend wherever you are. And I hope that today's information was helpful. Don't forget to look down in the video description for further information and click the like button over here. Oh, by the way, fluff part. Guess what YouTube's doing? YouTube's like Google. Google owns YouTube. They're doing away with a thumbs down button on the videos. So I think uh, they did a lot of profiling and studies about that. If you didn't have the ability to give a video a dislike. See, because it's one thing to like a video. Oh, I like the video, so you click the thumbs up. Uh, you really don't care about the video too much, so you just don't like it. You just don't click the like. But then there's another level where, oh man, I dislike that video. I hate that YouTuber, you know, so thumbs down. So those are different levels, but they find out that there's a lot of satisfaction that some people get from seeing the thumbs down numbers go up. And YouTube says that there are gangs of viewers that go after certain producers. I'm thankful not to have experienced that myself, but the psychology of it was really interesting. So what they've decided to do is there'll be a thumbs down, you know, or a dislike button or something like that there. You just won't see a count associated with it. So the creator, the YouTube person that puts that information out, uh, will be able through their analytics to see the number of dislikes on a video, but they found psychologically that these people want to see those numbers go up. They want to see uh, that they disliked a video, other than that it just says dislike, and how many other people disliked it. So there's a lot of arguments about that. I'm curious about your thoughts about do dislikes help you when you look at a video or do you look more at the likes? Or do you look at the likes versus dislikes? And does that inform you? And I guess I don't want to ask if you feel good when you give somebody a dislike because you really want to let them know that you dislike it. Because I get a few people like that, but it's not a big deal because it's in the first few seconds that the dislike uh, button often shows up that somebody disliked a video. So I know they didn't watch it. So it's really about the YouTuber themselves that they're disliked. So, and the, the argument was that uh, they said that some new YouTubers that are trying to start out, that are trying to do a good job, that they get disheartened uh, when a whole bunch of dislikes, when somebody mobs them and there's a whole bunch of dislikes there and uh, they just don't feel good about YouTubing. Uh, my eldest son is one of those. He could not handle any criticism. And uh, when he started getting dislikes, that was it, he's just out. He couldn't do it, didn't want any part of it. Or the haters that make comments that really tear you down, you know, so. You have to assume that if somebody is really angry and they really want to tear somebody down and they make it personal, just dismiss those people. Let those people go. But I'm interested if you think that the hiding of the dislikes is going to help a bunch of new YouTubers feel better and continue to produce good content. And then do you find that there's enough information just by seeing the thumbs up down there? And if a you know, if there's a bunch of views and there's a bunch of thumbs up, is it valuable to you to see if there's any thumbs down on it? So that's it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. Thanks for watching, and I'll see some of you live tomorrow at 4 p.m. Thanks for watching.